Hello, folks. Welcome to another edition of Inside the Marble Palace, Saskatchewan Post Media's look at the legislature and all its goings on this week. Lots of goings on. It was budget week. I am Murray Mandrick. I am the political columnist for the Regina Leader Post. With me is Jeremy Sines, our legislative reporter, and Alex Loam. Hi, Alec. How you doing, buddy? Thanks so, so much for the good hard work on the budget. Alec covers just about everything at the Leader Post and does a fantastic job uh, and was right in the middle of our budget uh, coverage this week. I'm going to start with Jeremy. Let's let's do a quick overview of everything in the budget possible or as much as we possibly can in a quick overview. Yeah, absolutely. So we are seeing a 463 million deficit. This is still a deficit, but it's quite less than what we saw in the past budget where the government projected 2.6 billion deficit there. So they're pretty much slashing about 2 billion off the deficit, a little bit more than that. So we're seeing some improvement there. The reason for that is we are seeing better revenues in the province, better uh, economic activity, 2.9 billion in uh, oil and gas and potash revenue, which is a lot more than last year. And uh, as well, eight billion in taxes and three point five billion from federal transfers. Obviously, what this means is uh, just more room uh, for the government to spend. But how they're spending it is basically to to really cut out this deficit and actually spend some money on the debt as well. About four hundred fifty million is going to that. Meanwhile, though, the news that really came out is while we are maybe getting more fiscally on track, like the government says, we are seeing uh, uh, new PSTs on a bunch of services. So your rider games. Um, going to the gym, that sort of thing, some hikes on smokes and that. And so that's going to bring in about um, 20 million ish annually for the province. And it coincides with another news item that came out, which was about 20 million on a surgical initiative. And this is to help with the backlog in the province, get more people uh, their surgeries done. As we know, with COVID-19, a lot of people couldn't have those surgeries done because healthcare workers were dealing with, you know, COVID patients. So the province is trying to square this as, you know, we're investing in key services like health. We're also tackling the deficit. And yeah, so that that's the budget for you in a snapshot. In a, in a nutshell. Alec, you've covered a couple of these now. And more to the point, we're covering them now in what will hopefully be the post-pandemic era because the last couple... We haven't had people in the rotunda as much. We haven't had people in the chamber as visitors. It was kind of back to that 2019 vibe from uh, the budget before. Did you notice that too? Did you notice that in the rotunda when you were out there? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's, it's one of those things where through the past two years and change of the pandemic, we've had to do remote journalism. You know, we've been working from home for over two years at this point. And whenever we're trying to actually find somebody or, or find a source or find a minister or find, you know, somebody that's a part of a, a relevant organization to a file that we're writing for the day, we have to go through email, through phone, through whatever it is. And actually being in the rotunda yeah. and it was it was packed, which was strange, you know, maybe a little bit uh, hair raising for some, but it was it, nice to be there. But it meant that we were able to essentially, you know, if, if I needed to speak to a minister and I saw them, I could go, great, I can go and just talk to them. I can scrum them right then and there in the rotunda, or if there's an advocate, or if there's a member of the opposition, everybody was just there. Everybody was milling about. And it was a, it was a really, it was kind of nice in a way because it, it, it made it, um, made that aspect of, of journalism, the sort of community aspect of it, being able to see your peers, being able to see, um, you know, MLAs and all the rest of it in person. It was a really nice return in that way. And I think that. It, it, it's certainly easier for us uh, to do our jobs when we're able to just go and speak to the people that we need to speak to. And uh, certainly also helps with our deadlines and the quick And I, I actually think it actually changed yesterday. the mood of the visitors. There were people mm-hmm. there not terribly pleased with all aspects of the budget. But generally from what I, I don't know, if did, you might have seen the same thing, Alec. From the people that I talked to, I think they too were just happy to be out and about and doing things in somewhat of a more normal way as, as this uh, budget. Did you sense that a little bit in the reaction maybe? or? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I think case in point of that is when uh, Premier Mo uh, took to the podium to speak after you know budget came down and everything was running a little bit late. But when he was actually up at the podium speaking uh, over a PA system, 
you could barely <laughs> yeah, hear them right. uh, sometimes over the din of other people speaking over the other conversation that was happening. And I mean, you, you got the feeling that it was a little bit of a reunion in a weird way, because you're like you mentioned, we, we haven't had this sort of interaction, this sort of a media day since 2019. And, you know, we're into 2022 pretty, pretty firm at this point. So, no, there was definitely a totally different feeling to covering a budget this time around. And even in the sense that while, like Jeremy said in, in the great cliff notes of, of what this budget entailed, there was still quite a bit of talk of COVID, a lot of the impacts of COVID, but it, it felt very different than the last two budgets, especially the 2020 budget, which was kind of hastily uh, reorganized at, at almost the 11th hour when I do believe that that day or the day before was the first day that we had uh, confirmed community transmission in Saskatchewan. So yeah, two years on, it, it was radically different from the last We're going to get into the uh, specifics, hopefully a little bit more, including uh, um, uh, some of the stories that you covered. I'm fascinated by, by SIS. I'm fascinated by uh, what they're doing with uh, 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 prairie, harm and, or prairie harm reductions in Saskatoon to, uh, to, to reduce... Uh, uh, drug overdoses and, and that organization not getting funded. But before I go there, uh, Jeremy, where do you think, or from what you've seen in the last 24 hours plus, where do you think the government has trouble spots and where do you think maybe it's succeeding a little bit more in its budget uh, uh, delivery? I think like every other budget I've seen, uh, the government gets up for it. They're pretty upbeat. They're pretty, uh, uh, pretty hyped for being able to deliver what is their centerpiece uh, legislation, their their centerpiece activity throughout the whole year. But I think even more so this year, they're leaning towards one or two things. But what was your sense in terms of, of where mm-hmm. the government is seeing successes and maybe, I guess, a little bit where they're already running into trouble spots? Yeah, we'll start with the trouble spots. I think it it might be this PST thing. It might be these additional taxes. We are seeing the NDP today raising the issue in the House, really hammering the government saying, you know, this isn't the right time to do this. Gas prices are high. Inflation is high. People are having a hard time affording things. So why are you adding another cost onto people? Obviously, uh, the government is arguing, you know, this is this is pretty mild in a way. It's not a big cost, but the NDP likes to say, well, it's still a cost at the end of the day and people are, are counting their pennies right now. and. You know, they don't want to see any more additional costs. So they're going to have to really sell that, I think. On the flip side, obviously, they're really championing the fact that they've reduced the deficit quite significantly and that they do have a plan to get back onto budget. I think they realize people in Saskatchewan do like to see balanced budgets. They like to see fiscally responsible governments. And so I, I think they're really selling that point. On health care, I think it's this is one's kind of interesting, I think, where they're really saying, hey, look, we're investing in healthcare. We're going to get our surgeries down. And this is something they've always really championed. So as long as I think that pans out for them, they're really going to be happy with that. Obviously, the NDP is saying, you know, this is not enough to address the surgical backlog. Uh, you need to be doing more right now. And we're seeing the health unions also say, you know, please don't privatize healthcare, even though the government is going to. And I don't think they're a huge, huge fan of it either, even though the government really is saying we're, we're going to tackle this issue head on. Alec, I've always fascinated by, by two aspects, the push and pull in politics that often revolves around government think versus public think in terms of what they see as a priority. And as Jeremy said, the, the PST, particularly on rider games, particularly on concerts, the kind of things that, well, if I went to, I'd go to if I was younger, but obviously I'm too old to do most of that stuff now. But the kind of things that that mm-hmm. that that people in this city kind of really need after two years of pandemic are being taxed right now. It's not a big tax; it's discretionary spending. And I strongly suspect that anybody going to the Ryder game isn't going to be all that deterred by an extra six percent tax on it. Yet, I'm also sensing that. There's some people that are really crapped off about that in particular and taxes on entertainment. Did you get that sense in a rotunda? Are you just sort of getting that sense from other people that you're talking to right now in terms of how problematic that is, Alec? Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe it wasn't necessarily on on full display in the rotunda, but certainly today talking to a few people just following the budget as we do. You know, we'll be chasing stories out of this week, month, rest of the session. 
And I, I mean, like when it, when it comes to something, I, I spoke with um, the executive director at the cultural exchange in, in Regina this morning. He said, you know, really our, our tickets are like 20 bucks, 35 bucks. What's, what's 6% extra on that? It's not a lot. They're not anticipating that being a huge barrier to people coming out and experiencing concerts, live music, events, etc. But at the end of the day, it's a flat tax. And like Jeremy said, inflation is high, gas is soaring, and everything just costs more. So as people are, you know, counting pennies, as people are trying to budget, as people are trying to be responsible with finances in odd times, uncertain times, and increasingly expensive times, this is just another fee. It's another cost that people are going to be dealing with. But I think I think the one that left people really scratching their head was the tax on gyms, right? That 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 was the interesting point of if you're a gym rat or a smoker, you're now going to be experiencing yeah. additional taxes. So something that the government essentially wants to discourage, which is a bad behavior like smoking, sorry smokers, that gets taxed the same as a good behavior going to the gym. And I, I I've seen some people essentially saying like, why on earth is this? the reaction but of course that increase in pst it's 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 meant to generate roughly 20 million dollars in revenue i do believe which is another attempt to i think diversify a little bit where the public coffers are coming from not quite as reliant but still heavily reliant on resource revenue and commodity prices but i mean in in the reaction though to that additional pst i mean you even had the riders you know this is a great cup year here and the rough riders are saying you know this is going to affect all of our fans. This is going to affect everybody that wants to come to a game. And as somebody that lives in the city, as somebody that likes to go to the occasional rider game, I I go and I buy my ticket and I'm, I'm looking at what the cost is and I go, oh yeah, there's the stadium fee, ah, GST, ah, and now there's going to be PST. So certainly that's going to, you know, maybe not for me as just a single dude, but as somebody who is maybe looking to buy tickets for an entire family, that adds up. That makes a day going to the Ryder game. That makes a day going to the Pats. That makes a day going to any of these events, rodeos as well, just a little bit more expensive. And again, you know, inflation's high. And well, ab- absolutely. Tight, and, you know. and it adds up. It, the Riders, I think, generated in 2019, and traditionally in the good years, obviously, last year and the year before especially were bad years, but last year with a shortened season and in 2020 with no season at all, no gate revenue. But on a good year, 16, 17 million now in terms of gate re- revenue, more this year uh, because of the Great Cup, although it should be noted that the tax doesn't really take go into effect until October 31st, so it will be mostly aimed at the gate. Uh, great cup, but it's seventeen million dollars a year. If you do that six percent uh, tax mass, that's an extra million dollars the the a year that the government will be taken from rider fans. And I can't imagine any government wanting to ever offend rider fans in this uh, in this this province. Jeremy, the, even the opposition. I, mean, I say that even the opposition because sometimes they don't seize on the day to day real issues that people are feeling out there. We'll get into some of the other things that they made the point on uh, uh, earlier or later with, uh, uh, with, with Alec and, and you, but they actually even grabbed onto this whole notion of, uh, of the costs going up of entertainment, et cetera. Where else do you think the opposition mm-hmm. is scoring some points in this particular budget? That's a really good question. I think like health, we might see them score some more points on there, just saying it isn't enough. They're not doing enough for doctors. Um, This is kind of a a sidebar, but 95 million is budgeted for COVID-19 response. The government in the past spent a lot more money on COVID because we saw so many hospitalizations. So they could capitalize that on that too, if, you know, the government has to go over that 95 million. Education might be another one. I know the Saskatchewan Teachers Federation isn't happy with this budget. The School Boards Association isn't happy with this budget. It is an increase overall to the budget. I think it's almost two billion just on operating expenses, but that's only a 1.3% increase uh, when inflation right now is 4.7%. And so they were wanting that increases of up to 4% to match inflation. Um, And just how education budgets work, it's like, when you get more kids, you need more money. And if the money doesn't match the growth in kids, the NDP likes to argue, well, that's actually a cut because it's not matching the growth that's actually there in our school system. So they're going to seize on schools, I think, as well, just as um, education school boards budget and teachers was certainly under pressure on that front. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it, 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 uh, health, it was, I guess, yeah, it was. 
health, I guess you could argue they're somewhat yeah. keeping up. But what I found fascinating is that once you, when push comes to shove, two hundred and eighty-eight million dollars is at way below the, which is a sizable increase if you think of it in dollar terms for the health budget. But really, it's below inflation. And if you look in terms of what was actually spent last year, they're only spending three point five million more in health. Uh, they're in terms of what was actually. Uh, spent ultimately by the end of the year. Is that going to get the government in trouble? Because I think the minister, Jeremy, had an odd answer to the question. She's, she's, someone asked, it was, is that going to be enough? And she basically said, well, I guess we'll see it mid-year. Right. Yeah, no, right. Exactly. Um, the money is more, like you say, for sure. But is it really a lot more? Is it really um, measuring against the the higher costs we're seeing right now, that's a good question, and I'm I'm not sure I have the answer to that. But yeah, it's it, it's just a really good question to see because it's it's not as much as maybe I think a lot of people were really hoping for. Yeah, and I think that's a problem. Budgets are always torn between things that you like to do to spend money on and things that you have to do. And one of the areas that you focused on was the SIS uh, money. Did the government, you, and you kept asking this question, and good for you, Alec, for doing so, about is this a formula that now works? Is this the solution? What do you think the answer to that was, and, and what do you think the government's uh, uh, thoughts are in terms of that being an answer? Or like, in ter well, I, I mean, the problem there is that how the ministry defines success of a program like SIS is... It, it, it leaves a little bit to be desired because there aren't necessarily the there isn't the data collected to really understand what is working and what isn't working. Case in point, when I asked uh, Minister for Social Services, uh, Lori Carr, how they measure success with the SIS program, she said that they essentially look to have fewer people using the program. The problem there is that if somebody leaves province, if there's a lapse in enrollment in the program, if they are, if they have found employment and they no longer need it, or if they die, that's all counted the same. And now she said that it would be great to be able to have sort of a back end interview when somebody is exiting the program to figure out why they're leaving it and, and the reasons why that they could build off of. But she said that that's hard to do. The ministry isn't set up to do that, etc. cetera. Um, but there, there, there seems to be specifically from the Regina Anti-Poverty Ministry and Carmichael and even organizations like the Saskatchewan's Landlords Association, there still seems to be a lot to be desired uh, when it comes to SIS and how this program is functioning right now because opposition hammered on it as well. Uh, I do believe Trent Weatherspoon said that this was a bloody heartless program. Uh, Mira Conway had similar rhetoric as well saying, you know, it's a slap in the face and it, it does not work and the program has essentially failed. That's also the message that we got when it was fully rolled out in September of 2021. That's around the time that we saw Camp Hope uh, pop up in Regina. So from that perspective, I mean, people that are involved in the program and advocates that are a part of social uh, uh, social assistance programs and who kind of occupy that, that world, they didn't seem to be pleased, uh, let's say, with the announcement and, the and it's troublesome one good thing that people are happy about jeremy we're sort of getting some more support actually significant support eight million dollars for a, a, an industry like this is mm. is significant but creative saskatchewan is upping its budget after 10 years ago um ending the film tax credit i think if i remember correct was about 11 million dollars a year at the time so it was almost an admission of uh yes uh, yesterday from the government that maybe they took the wrong course. Uh, do you think it was a bit that, or do you th I, I'm very curious as to why the government changed its policy, but, but, but tell us their explanation for that, Jeremy, if you can. Yeah, for sure. So it is going up to 10 million and they were the only ones maybe really happy with this budget, I think. Yeah. And the government's explanation is we are seeing more streaming services uh, across Canada and Saskatchewan should get on this wave and should try and attract more people to film here in the province, even though when we cut the credit, a lot of people left. So I guess now they're really trying to seize on that opportunity. Um, and yeah, so I guess people are super happy with it. Uh, Minister Harp Howard made a note she would love to see a hallmark 
movie filmed and me too. in Saskatchewan. Yeah, right so now. we'll see if. <laughs> so we will see. Well, if I can't that be a happens. Hallmark guy. And um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, no, it, it, it's. Um, it, 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 it was they, a funny comment. It wasn't really, like it really was. should... The problem being with it, it, it all seriousness, it, it's going to take a lot to get a big production and even a Hallmark thing by our, by Saskatchewan standards is a quote big Hollywood production. Uh, we had something vaguely resembling that when we actually had studios and and real film companies based out of here and we were doing movies uh, like The Englishman's Boy and a few others that, that were significantly large movies. Uh, it, I, I, I guess it's a good thing to basically try and revive that, but it's not going to happen overnight. Alex, as we close up, what do you think you saw that that is actually also going to get the government either moving forward or into trouble? They talked a lot today about... Uh, how this all fits perfectly into their agenda of uh, uh, building the economy that's largely based on resources. But even that's problematic in the sense that we don't know where oil and potash are going to go. And uh, it largely depends on what happens in Ukraine and, uh, and, and elsewhere. Uh, do you, do you, I, I didn't get a chance to ask you before, but do you see particular places where the government might be getting into trouble in this budget? Well, I mean... I honestly think that one thing that might serve as a, a tremendous boon to them is is what WTI is trading at right now because I mean they've pegged it in their budget at seventy five dollars and when I last checked I do believe it's trading for one hundred and twelve American a barrel so windfall, that could be yeah. a potential windfall when it comes to the mid year you know that could be you know closer to you know it's chipping off the old deficit and providing we have a good harvest I mean that might be job done for a party that really styles themselves as being deficit hawks but I I don't know I I, I think that. I think that there might be a underestimation as to how unpopular these PST fees are going to be with people because it's a flat tax, right? It affects everybody. And just as it is right now, people have less money. And I mean, pretty soon we're yet again going to be the province with, I do believe, the lowest minimum wage. So I think that those sorts of issues, just real basic kitchen table issues like affordability will maybe come to bite them a little bit. But I, I don't know. Um, that, that's the one thing that specifically stands out to me. But I mean, that point too about just everything costing more, to get back to SIS, I mean, the, the announcement there though was that there was 11.4 million additional dollars for the SIS program, which means that clients will get an additional $30 to their allowance, 25 to their shelter. That means for people living in Regina and Saskatoon that their rents will now be covered $600. But that includes utilities, and if you can find rent and utilities in Regina or Saskatoon for six hundred dollars, let me know. Uh, but that's again another issue of affordability that I think is probably going to loom large for a lot of people, especially a vocal group of people that have been agitating around issues like SIS well, absolutely. and affordability. I guess we could keep go on and on about this budget, but I am, be honest with you guys. I got five Hallmark movies on my PVR. I got to get to them before I lose them. So, uh, <laughs> and that's about all the time we have as well. So, I will see you guys soon at the ledge and on Inside the Marvel Palace. Jeremy, Alec, thank you for your insights and uh, uh, happy budget day.